This is a work of political and social commentary. The content of this video is not meant for children under the age of 13. Parental discretion is advised. I don't like to owe people money. It's a pretty simple concept to understand, I think. I'd rather pay off what I owe and be free from debt. In the current economy, it's difficult to acquire the American dream without debt, though. To earn money, especially outside of major cities, Americans need to own a car. Cars are expensive, so people borrow money. In order to get a decent job and earn more money, Americans usually have to get at least some sort of higher education, whether it's trade school or college. Education is really expensive, so people borrow money. Next, owning a home is a big part of the American dream. Houses are really, really expensive, though, so people borrow money. Like I said, it's difficult to acquire the American dream without at least some debt. To me, owing $23,000 in interest-bearing debt is a lot of money. $23 million is far too much money for a private citizen, and quite a bit for most business owners. $23 billion is almost an unimaginable debt for any individual or organization short of the government. Right now, the U.S. federal government owes over $23 trillion, and that's absolutely insane. Naturally, I have some roasted opinions on that subject. Ask any economist, especially those who are fans of Keynesian economics, and they will tell you that government debt in and of itself is not a bad thing. The ability to borrow money in the form of treasury bonds allows the government to regulate the monetary supply and keep the economy on a more even keel. It also allows the government to provide relief when needed and to pay for enormously expensive but necessary expenditures like fighting World War II. I'm of a slightly different opinion. Like I said, I don't like owing people money, and the federal debt is owed by the federal government, which belongs to the American people. From that standpoint, it's money that we the people owe to those who hold treasury bonds, to the tune of $70,000 plus per person, not per taxpayer. Every child born in America today will be born more than $70,000 in debt. Ugh, some debt is necessary. There's a time to borrow money, whether to regulate the monetary supply to prevent a recession or to pay for a war debt. Borrowing money by issuing government bonds to fund discretionary spending in a time of peace, safety, and plenty? Um, no. Just no. That's when we should be paying off the debt, not adding to it. Many people assume that the government has always had debt. In general, yes, but not quite so. In 1835, the national debt was actually paid off for a brief time by Andrew Jackson, but the liquidation of the Second Bank of the U.S. triggered a currency crisis which caused the national debt to rebuild somewhat. Indeed, until the 20th century, national debt was incurred largely because of wars, not deficit spending on non-military expenses. The national debt rose and fell by significant percentages as war debt accumulated and was slowly paid off up until the Great Depression when the general trend of incurring and carrying debt really began. Of all presidents, Calvin Coolidge paid off the national debt in the most sustainable manner. So how did he do it? Well, a lot of you won't like this, but it was through trickle-down economics. There were two prongs in his attack on the debt, taxes and spending. First, he carried forward the surpluses he inherited by continuing to keep spending increases to a minimum and instructing government employees to find cost savings whenever possible. That allowed him to reduce the federal budget from $3.14 billion in expenditures in 1923 all the way down to $2.857 billion in 1927. Along the way, those budgets were less than the federal receipts by at least $713 million every year, including one year in which the government took in over 40% more than it spent. The second axis of attack was taxes. No, not raising them, lowering them. In 1923, the top marginal rate was 58% and there were 50 tax brackets. Coolidge got four tax cuts passed by Congress, which reduced the number of tax brackets to 23 and lowered the top marginal rate to 25%. 
taxes were reduced to the point where the median household paid just 1.5% in income taxes. And the economy responded to all of this reduction in government spending and taxation by booming. The average GDP growth rate was 3.5%, with instances of 7% GDP growth. Overall, GDP grew by 21.2% in five years despite the cuts in government spending, and the national debt was significantly reduced. And that might explain some of why these years were called the Roaring Twenties. People had more money than they had ever had before because they kept more of the money that they earned. They spent that money, and that fueled more economic growth and more investment. Now, with $23 trillion in debt, economists point out that the national debt is slowing economic growth by a full percentage point or more. Let me put that into perspective. In 2019, the annual GDP growth rate was about 2.3%. Without the drag effect of the national debt, that number would be closer to 4%. We've got to get the national debt under control. We cannot simply keep kicking the can down the road. That will mean that we have to ensure a strong money supply, simplify the tax system, lower tax rates, and above all, spend less. This debt is a millstone which will eventually slow our economy to a crawl, and if we don't reduce the debt, eventually there won't be any more money to borrow. While the economy is booming, is the time to whittle this mountain down. I propose that we start the cuts with subsidies. Federal payments made to stimulate economic growth during a weak economy are one thing, but continuing those subsidies through strong economic growth periods results in dependency and unsustainable growth in both debt and economic sectors, which aren't innovating fast enough. There's a better way to stimulate growth and innovation, letting businesses face the risks of competition in a free market. We also need to look at which programs are accomplishing what. There are a lot of offices which spend federal money to provide specific services, and a lot of them are redundant. An example of this redundancy is the urban housing programs managed by HUD and the rural housing programs managed by the Department of Agriculture. By simply reorganizing programs to combine these like services, cost savings can be derived from eliminating redundant people and redundant offices. Next, transition the Medicaid program to block grants. This has been proposed for a long time. Currently, the federal government will provide unlimited matching funds for state Medicaid expenditures. While it's tough, there has to be a limit on how much money the federal government spends. Block grants will provide that cap, allowing the government to accurately project how much each state will receive based on population. Further to that, Medicare premiums and coverage need to be reformed. Right now, there is a gap in coverage between routine health care coverage and catastrophic health care coverage. Nicknamed the donut hole, is a gap into which many of the elderly fall each year. There needs to be continuous rates of coverage and copayments throughout routine health care to eliminate this. On the flip side, though, premiums and copayments need to be closely indexed to income, including income from outside sources. The maximum premium and copay schedules need to be set at a sustainable level for the program. This will make health care a little more expensive for those who can afford to pay more, but it won't affect those who can't. As for Social Security, well, currently increases in Social Security benefits are indexed to wages earned over the beneficiary's lifetime. Indexing Social Security benefit increases to the Consumer Price Index makes better fiscal sense. That way, the Social Security payment would be sufficient for all beneficiaries to afford their basic living expenses. And those who paid more into the system would still be able to afford retirement due to their private retirement savings and independent pensions. Social Security doesn't work like a regular pension, with individual accounts for each pensioner. The overall outlays must decrease by lowering the limit on the maximum individual benefit. Lastly, we need to dig into the defense budget. We simply don't know how much cost savings is available without reducing the strength and readiness of the Department of Defense because spending isn't properly tracked. Recent audits of the Department of Defense have revealed insufficient accounting for enormous amounts of spending. That cannot continue. We know that the acquisition process for new equipment involves massive development grants to defense contractors. The Department of Defense hands out over $100 billion in research grants every year. These aren't grants to acquire the technologies, they are grants just to fund the research. Yet the results are bought independent of the research costs associated with those grants. In point of fact, competitive procurement means that research grants are given to multiple defense contractors 
most of whom produce prototypes which are not accepted for full production. Research is good, but not to the tune of a trillion dollars every 10 years for equipment which in most cases we never buy. Research grants need to be cut back. A lot. Let them be reserved for equipment which we are actually going to buy or already have in service. These are all costs which will hurt to trim, but not as much as alarmists might think. We need to be prepared to trim those costs if we are ever going to pay down the national debt. And if countries don't start exercising some real fiscal responsibility, including ours, then eventually their national debts will collapse the global economy. Let's get in front of the trend on this one, shall we?